That was the Black Keys singing Dead and Gone. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about death, but not quite that directly. I'm going to be talking about mummies and mummification. And I should warn you now that if you are a squeamish person, there may be bits of this that you don't find so pleasant. So maybe you want to turn the station away and come back in an hour or so. But hopefully you'll be able to stick with us because this is actually a really interesting topic. And the whole reason that I'm into this uh, whole concept is that I used to want to be an Egyptologist. And when I was very little, uh, my mom was encouraging my interest. And I remember that we went out and we bought a plastic baby doll and we went through the process of mummification using all that we had read about how mummies were made in Egypt. And this was for a school project, not just the kind of random thing you do on a weekend. But um, actually there are lots of things that we didn't know at the time and lots of advances that have been made since then. And so that's why I'm kind of interested in revisiting this topic and finding out about the science that is used in studying mummies and the science that's behind the process of, of mummification in general. And to really understand what a mummy is, you first have to know a little bit about decomposition. So it's basically caused by two main factors. And the first of these is autolysis, which is the breakdown of tissues by the body's own chemicals and enzymes. And that begins happening basically as soon as someone dies. And then there's also putrefaction, which is the breakdown of tissues by bacteria, both those that are already present in the body and those that are added later on as they kind of find the body and begin to break it down wherever it is after death. Now most decomposers are bacteria and fungi, but also scavengers can play a really important role in helping a body break down and um, become the kind of nutrients that can then cycle back through the system. Invertebrates decomposition goes through five different stages. Uh, flesh, sorry not flesh, fresh, uh, bloat, active and advanced decay, and dry, and then remains. And basically what happens with mummification is that you've got the body arrested in this very first stage of, of freshness. So there might be some little amount of decomposition that, that occurs, but basically it's then stopped from going on any further, and everything is held pretty much intact. And mummies have been created both by people and also by nature. And actually the word mummy comes from a term that refers to embalmed corpse. So originally this whole concept had to do with mummies that were made by people who were deliberately trying to preserve bodies. But we now use it to refer to both naturally and accidentally preserved bodies. <clears throat> And basically, these are things that have been preserved in such a way that they, will, they have undergone very little decay already, and they won't undergo further decay as long as they're kept in kind of cool, dry conditions away from bacteria. And we find that these things can be created from exposure to embalming chemicals, obviously, so through the work of humans, through extreme cold, and these are known as ice mummies, uh, very low humidity, such as what you would find in deserts, and also anaerobic conditions, which you find in uh, wetlands, so the bog bodies that I was talking about last week. Mummies have been found around the world, even though we do tend to think of them primarily in association with Egypt. And Egypt is really famous because its history of mummification does go back for quite a long time, and it involves both humans and animals. So the first intentional mummification was known to happen in Egypt at around 3500 BC. And the earliest intact mummy from this area actually does date to almost the very beginning of this era, so to about 3400 BC. And that body is actually stored in the British Museum, and I'm not sure if they have it on display or not, but it is here in the UK. Another place that has lots of mummies that you don't hear about very often is South America. And these were predominantly from Chile and southern Peru, where you've got a lot of mummies that were prepared deliberately by the local cultures, but also accidental mummies that were found up in the Andes where it's quite cool and can be very, very dry. <coughs> Excuse me. And the conditions that are found there in the Atacama Desert, they favor natural mummification, and they're actually found in lots of other places where we do also see natural mummies forming. So one of these is soil that's rich in nitrates, because when you combine nitrates and a very arid environment, and basically you've got the preservation of organic materials. You also have soil that has a lot of salt in it, and salt can halt the growth of bacteria, which of course would then work on decomposing a body. The hot and dry conditions there will facilitate rapid desiccation, 
And these are happening not during the winter months where it obviously can get very, very cold, but during the warmer times of year, you can rapidly evaporate body fluids. And so that means that there aren't uh, the favorable environments that bacteria and fungi need to survive and engage in decomposition. <clears throat> so altogether, these sorts of things ensure that the soft tissues will dry before they have a chance to decay, and that's what leads to a mummification process. Now you also do see small, smaller numbers of mummies being found in Europe and the Middle East and even the Far East. And I mentioned last year when I was, uh, last week when I was talking about wetlands, that Europe is particularly well known for its bog bodies that are found in sphagnum bogs. And these are often in places like the UK and Ireland, Germany, and in particular Scandinavia. And this is because there is really highly acidic water and very cold temperatures and a lack of oxygen. And together these things mean that basically the bodies that are in the water are being tanned. So often the skeleton will disintegrate because the, the conditions are right for the minerals of the skeleton to be reabsorbed by uh, the water and distributed through the ecosystem. But the rest of the body will be left intact. And it essentially is the same process that we go through when we're tanning leather. And so if you look at pictures of these people, which I will post on the Wildside webpage. It's really amazing because they look absolutely pristine, like maybe they're just someone who fell asleep, but they're very, very tan, so they're quite dark brown. And a couple of these are, are very famous, and they have their own names, and so they're kind of well-known bodies that were found. And one of them is the Harold Scour woman, and she dates back to the fifth century BC. And what's amazing about her is that her body unusually included not only the skin, but also the skeleton and the internal organs. And another of these bog bodies that's quite well known is the Toland Man. And he dates back to the 4th century BC and was actually so well preserved that whenever he was first found, people thought that he was someone who had recently been murdered. And it wasn't until they took him to the experts and had him examined that they realized that this was someone who had only um, recently been recovered but had died a very, very long time ago. And one of the reasons that they knew this was that the body was found resting in close association with a type of moss that was known to have occurred during the early Iron Age, so it was about 2,000 years old, and uh, you would only have seen this close proximity if the body were also that old. Another interesting thing about the Toland man was that when they examined the body, they found evidence of rope furrows in his skin, uh, particularly underneath his chin, and this indicated that he had been hanged. And when they analyzed the contents of his stomach, and that's something I will talk about in more detail later on, they found particular types of seeds that are actually quite hard to get, which suggests that they had been collected for a special occasion. And also they're found only very locally along that very same stream bank where the man was found. And that kind of suggested to researchers that maybe uh, there had been some sort of a springtime gathering where these seeds were available to be eaten, and this was maybe a, a large group of people, and this man had done something, and he had gotten in trouble for it, and he had been hanged in retaliation. And of course, it's hard to ever say anything like that for sure, but it's quite interesting to think about all the information that can be collected from these bodies, even though they are thousands of, or hundreds of years old. And that, again, is something I am going to visit a bit later, because that's where I really think that the idea of mummification gets quite interesting. When you think about kind of the archaeological forensics involved, and all the data that we can extract from these very, very old bodies. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is how a mummy is made. And I'm not talking about the natural sorts of mummies, because I've already pretty much gone over that, but the mummies that are made deliberately by people. And I'm going to start off by thinking about mummification in Egypt, because Egypt is really the place that we think of as being kind of the center of mummification. And what a lot of people don't know is that early on, the Egyptians did not bury their dead in the kind of standard uh, pyramid kind of format with people wrapped in linen and placed in sarcophagi. That's only something that developed later on. Earlier on, what they did was they would dig a pit in the desert and kind of fold up the body uh, in kind of almost a fetal position and place it in this rectangular pit, put sand on it, and then leave it. And because the sand would get very, very hot out in the desert, and it was in close contact with the body, it would quite rapidly dehydrate the bodies and get rid of uh, any chance that the bacteria would have of decomposing it. And so we have basically humans that are creating natural mummies. But 
a problem with this is that you would often have animals out in the desert that would come dig up the bodies. And of course the Egyptians didn't like this, they didn't want their bodies desecrated. And so they began to instead put them in coffins. But then they noticed that when they did this, they removed that contact with the hot and dry sand, and that led to decomposition. And they didn't want decomposition because they wanted these bodies to remain intact in the way that they would want to be seen in the afterlife. So they had to develop all of their own techniques for replicating the mummification process um, and stopping decomposition while still allowing these bodies to be stored in containers. And what they came up with was a, a very long and detailed uh, multiple step embalming process. <clears throat> so they'd start off by washing the bodies with oils and wines and perfumes. And of course this has kind of multiple uses. It would be ceremonial and it would have kind of spiritual significance. It would smell probably more pleasant than a dead body would normally smell, but also in the process of washing they're quite likely getting rid of bacteria on the skin that would begin that decomposition process. They then made a cut in the left side of the body and they removed the internal organs. And although there may have been some kind of intellectual and spiritual purpose behind this, the most important thing about it is that the organs are the first part of the body to decompose. So by getting them out of there, they are ensuring that the body is going to last a bit longer so they can prepare it in other ways first. Now because these things decompose, you have to do something with them to keep them from also uh, decomposing because the the Egyptians wanted to keep absolutely everything together, all the way down to every drop of liquid that would come out of the body during the embalming process. So they would pack each of these internal organs in something called natron. And natron is a natural salt that's found along the shores of salt lakes. And it's very good, in particular, at preserving flesh. So they would go out and collect massive amounts of natron because they use quite a lot in, of it in each embalming attempt. So they would pack these things in the natron and then leave them somewhere else to dry. And they often would leave the heart in the body because it was considered uh, to be intellectually important. They sometimes would also leave the brain in the body, but when they didn't, they had a long implement that they would stick up the nasal passage, kind of scramble the brain basically, and then pull it out the nose. And that's something that I say quite coolly, but I've always thought that actually was a very gross thing. Um, and I kind of hate to dwell on that idea. So what they did once the body was more or less hollowed out is that they would cover it uh, and stuff it with natron in order to really dry it out and get rid of all of that moisture. And as I said, any of the fluids that were lost during this time would be collected so that they could also be added back in for burial. And the body was left in this state for a little over a month, so for about 40 days. And once that was done, it was washed again with Nile water, which again would get rid of anything that would settle on the skin that might uh, advance the decomposition process. And then rubbed again with oils. And this was quite an interesting thing because, as you might expect, if a body is packed with salt for a really long time, it's going to get kind of wrinkly. And they want the bodies, like I said, to look normal for the afterlife. And so they had to use the oil to improve the skin texture and make it a bit more normal again. And once this was done, they would take the internal organs that were now wrapped up separately and put them back inside the body cavity. And then they would stuff that so that it would look natural. And they would rub it with oils one last time and then begin to protect the bodies with linen. And they would wrap the head separately and then move on to the fingers and toes. And because these things or extremities could easily be broken when the body's being moved, they would often use guards, uh, little splints, things to kind of shore them up to make sure they would stay intact. Each of uh, the linen strips that's being used would, would get covered with a coat of liquid resin that would help glue the bandages together. And this is obviously quite nice for keeping things from coming undone, but also it's really going to seal the body up. It's going to seal away the oxygen, seal away the bacteria, and keep it nice and pristine inside all those wrappings. It might eventually also receive a canvas wrapping that would go over all of this, and in between all these layers you're going to have charms and amulets to help the soul of the person go to the afterlife. And finally, you're then going to place the body in a smaller coffin or sarcophagus that would then go into a larger one. And just before the body is interred, the Egyptians went through one final step, and that was uh, slicing open the bandages so that the mouth would be exposed in an open position. And this was an important ritual because they wanted the person to be able to breathe and eat, which would be 
quite important uh, in the afterlife where they again wanted them to do everything they could do uh, before they died. And this is really great for us because it allows us to do a lot of tests on the inside of the bodies and find out information uh, about the organs and find out condition of the body so people have been able to do research on, uh, this is very recent research actually, looking at the arteries and whether or not they were clogged and this is made possible by the fact that we can stick uh, scopes down the open mouths of these Egyptian mummies without damaging the rest of the body. And one of the other kind of cool things about the fact that the Egyptians were obsessed with keeping the bodies healthy and intact and all together in, in, in one place, if not in one piece, is that you can see evidence of, of how they would kind of readjust things to make sure that everything's all together if something kind of goes wrong in the movement of the body from place to place. So for example, uh, in some of the mummies, the teeth have fallen out, and so you can see where they have put teeth back in, sometimes in the wrong place or in the wrong alignment. Or if they couldn't get the teeth in the mouth, they would stick it wherever they could, so maybe in the nasal passage. Uh, places where their fingers have broken or their leg bones have broken, and so they've tried to wrap them back up and keep them all together. And when these sorts of little accidents happen, they can leave behind uh, details that are really useful for scientists later on who are collecting data about various aspects of the Egyptians' lives. So that's kind of in a nutshell how Egyptian mummies were made. And I'll have a break here for a minute to listen to a song. And when we come back from that, we'll think a little bit about how mummies were made in South America. Welcome back to The Wild Side. That was Mural Wagner singing No Death. And today we are talking about mummies and mummification. And just before the break, I was talking about how mummies were made in Egypt. And now I want to think a little bit about how mummies were created in South America. And even though we don't hear about mummies in association with South America all that much, actually this is the place where the oldest prepared mummified bodies uh, ever have been found. And these date back to 3000 to 5000 BC. And they predominantly come from the Chinchorro culture, which is found in northern Chile and southern Peru. And these guys preserved all the members of their society, not just the elite, which is what happened in Egypt. And so there are actually hundreds of mummified bodies that have been found here. And these, of course, represent only a small portion of the mummies that were ever made. But it's quite interesting because it's got um, this particular emphasis on very young children. And so it's just kind of a very different perspective on what purpose mummies serve and how they can be created by humans. So the Chinchoro actually had uh, several different mummification techniques and they've all been given separate names by archaeologists and anthropologists who've kind of studied these in detail to figure out why it is that these techniques were used because they're actually uh, quite odd if you compare them to the Egyptians. They're very extreme. So the first of these techniques is called the black mummy technique. And basically, what the Chinchero did was completely disassemble and reassemble the deceased person's body. So first, they would remove all of the appendages, and sometimes also the skin, and they would heat dry the body. So basically, they were smoking it. And they would cover the body then with an ash paste and fill in the gaps with natural materials. So things like um, vegetation and straw and that sort of thing. And then they would reattach the skin afterwards, once it had been dried and add a wig that was made of, of real human hair and then paint the whole thing with a dark coloring that was basically black and that's where the mummies got their name. The next technique is called the red mummy technique and it's quite similar to the Egyptian technique in many ways. So the chinchero would make multiple incisions to remove the internal organs and then dry the body cavity. And they would pack the body with natural materials again and often insert sticks in order to strengthen it. And this seems to have been a very important thing because these guys appear to have been involved in kind of an ancestor worship type thing. And they are literally worshiping these ancestors. So they're carrying around the bodies with them as they move from one encampment to another. And they're you know, placing them in places where they can have religious ceremonies associated with them. And so they needed to make sure they could live up to this movement from one place to another. And this is quite an interesting thing because you would think that these mummified bodies would actually become quite brittle over time. And this is why they've developed these techniques to try to help preserve them for as long as possible. And that's one of the reasons why there is such a difference between the South American mummies and those in Egypt. 
Now the third big technique is known as the mud coat technique. And here you've got clays and gypsum, both being used as cementing agents. And the gypsum is quite an interesting thing because it can act as a desiccant, so it kind of functions in the way that sand does. And both of these uh, things together facilitated the success of this technique, and you do see lots of bodies that were uh, mummified using the mud coat method. <coughs> and this allowed the mummies to basically be completely surrounded and encased in this layer of mineral um, materials. And this is quite nice not only for preserving the body, but also ensuring that there would be no smells that could uh, be released from that encasing section of, of the body. And another kind of interesting, although I guess a bit sad and, and morbid, fact about South America is that there are lots of mummies that have been found of children that seem to have been ritually sacrificed. And they were taken up to the summits of the Andes, and they were sacrificed there, and their bodies were left. And they were left um, presumably for the gods to come interact with in some way, but what they found was the elements. And the elements up there are perfect for creating these ice mummies because it's extremely dry, it's extremely cold. And so uh, this mostly happened during kind of the 16th century, and the bodies would remain there for hundreds of years until more modern explorers found them and were able to bring them down for study. And the bodies had frozen so soon after death that they did remain really well preserved over all those centuries. So let's say that you are a researcher and you have been brought one of these mummies from Egypt or from South America or from wherever they're found around the world and you want to study it. Well this is real, really where the kind of exciting stuff comes in because there are lots of techniques now that can be used to study mummies and extract a lot of information from them. And this the current method of studying a mummy is extremely different from the way it used to be when Westerners were first coming into contact with these in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And at that time, the mummies were often destroyed in the process of being examined. Basically, people would hold big parties. Um, this, is, this is true, actually. The Victorians would hold a party simply for the purpose of unwrapping a mummy, and that was it. So they would just have everyone come together, they would take off all the wrappings, they would look at what was inside, and then they would toss it out back. And not only is that kind of disrespectful, it's also wasting such a, a valuable resource. So now we try very hard to preserve the bodies and make sure that we can um, you know, kind of honor them as former people, but also extract information about the culture from which these people came. And this m means often we try to move away uh, from unwrapping them and, and actually leave them intact in their current wrappings, even in their sarcophagi if we need to, and then use kind of hands-off techniques very similar to those that are used in crime scene analysis. So one of the first and, and most simple of these is to take a lot of photographs. So you want to document the way a mummy looks, and this helps you not only kind of see where it was located, where it was found, what it looks like now, you know, kind of just in general what its appearance is, but you can take a series of these over time and inspect whether the condition is changing, whether you maybe need to store it in a different way to make sure it's being preserved the way that it should. We also use x-rays, and x-rays allow us to see what's inside the wrappings. And so sometimes we find that actually there are multiple bodies that are within a single set of wrappings. There might be extra parts. So often, if a woman was pregnant and she died with her unborn child, or if she died with a very young child, they would bury the two together in a single set of wrappings, and you can tell that by x-raying, and you would never have known that otherwise. You also can examine the mummy's wrappings, and this is usually done by people who are textile and basketry experts. So a little tiny piece will be snipped off in a place that uh, won't be seen by the public should the mummy go on display, and then it's sent off for chemical analysis. And this will allow people to see how rare it is, because if it's extremely rare, you probably won't proceed with unwrapping. Um, if it's not quite so rare, then you can do a bit more with the mummy. And by doing chemical analysis on this, you can maybe even see what region it's from, if you don't know already, what species was used to make the wrappings, what, what was in the resin that was painted over it. So you can get all sorts of information simply from the chemical analysis of the linen. You can also perform a dental examination, and this is where it comes in really handy, that the Egyptians would slice open um, the wrappings around the mouth and leave them open mouth exposed. 
because you can find out a lot about the mummies based on their teeth. The diet, you can find out whether they were eating a lot of meat or more vegetation. You can find out if they had good dental health or bad dental health. Uh, and this was often a very common case um, or reason why they died. They would have horrible um, orthodontic situations and they would die from infections of the mouth. So you can look uh, at cavities and try to understand how these played a role in the death of the mummies. You can see whether the teeth were worn down and how they were worn, and this can kind of help you determine how old a person was or, or where they were from, if they were in a rural area or the city, because that would have a big influence on diet. Then you can also perform histological examinations, and this involves looking at the soft tissue, so things like muscles and organs, under a microscope. And again, um, you often will take a sample from something that's not going to be obvious, it's not going to be on display. The canopic jars that used to be used often to store uh, the organs before the Egyptians started putting them inside the body cavity. These were great for this purpose because you've got tissues right there that you can get a really easy sample from. And mummies, of course, are very brittle and dry, and so you usually have to rehydrate the skin before you can um, analyze it. So they use water and special chemicals in order to get it in kind of um, pre-death conditions, basically, in order to then run it through these analyses. And that allows you to then um, find out things about kind of the condition of the cells, whether there, you can maybe extract data and get some information about whether there was a, an infection of some sort. You can maybe get some DNA and, and understand something about what ethnic group a mummy was from. And a lot of people will also assist these, uh, these techniques by using the pre-existing incisions that were made by the original mummifiers, which must be a really crazy thing um, to be interacting with the mummy in a very similar way to the way that the original people did thousands of years ago. So once you've done all of that, uh, I mentioned earlier that you can use this open mouth to put a scope in and look at what's happening inside the cavity. So this is known as an endoscopic analysis, and it's basically the same thing we do to people now when we're examining uh, the health of their intestines and their stomachs and their esophagus. So you can put this in and look for signs of disease, uh, you can potentially explore the last meal a person ate, and this all is going to depend on whether the, uh, the mummy was a natural mummy or one that was created by humans, whether the organs were put back in or preserved in jars. So it really depends on a, a mummy to mummy basis, what information you can get out exactly. But this is quite uh, a useful technique. And you can, of course, as I already kind of referred to, you can make some molecular uh, analyses as well. So there is actually DNA that has remained in these mummies without being broken down. And 2,000 years old or so is about the oldest sample that we have extracted. But that's amazing. You can actually look at the DNA and see how these people uh, were similar to us and how they were different from us. You can look at infections that they had because you can see traces of bacteria or fungi or whatever in the blood of these people. So there's actually a lot of information that you can extract from the the molecules that are left behind in mummies. You can also take samples from the hair in order to get information about the diet because you have uh, mineral deposition. And obviously if it's in the hair, that's something that happened a few months before the person died most of the time. But you can still get uh, some information as to whether they were anemic, whether they had kind of hemolytic disorders or other problems like that that would show up because they've got an imbalance of the sorts of things you would expect to find in a healthy person's hair. And finally, one last thing I'm only going to briefly mention now because I want to go into it in more detail below, is that you can perform facial reconstruction. And this is something that's a technique that's used uh, by archaeologists and also by people who do crime scene analysis. And it's kind of uh, a fledgling thing, and it really is a lot of art and not so much science, and there's quite a lot of um, subjectivity involved, but it can be a really interesting way to try to extract a bit of personality and to take a skeleton and put a, f a human face on it so that people can really relate to it a lot more. And it can be quite an interesting thing to put this together with all the other stuff that you can get out of the mummy. And that was Beck singing Already Dead, and you are listening to The Wild Side, where today we are talking about mummies and the process of mummification. 
And right before the break, I mentioned that one of the things you can do to get some information out of the mummy is to perform a reconstruction in order to get more information about what a mummy might have looked like and to give it a bit more personality. And this is something I actually want to go in into in more detail because there are lots of things you can do to try to reconstruct all of the various features that would have characterized any particular individual in life. And the first one of these involves CT scanning. And CT scanning is computerized tomography scan, otherwise known as CAT scan. And this uses x-rays to create really detailed images of the interior of the body. And basically what you have is a big x-ray tube that rotates around the body so the x-rays are passed through at multiple angles and then detected on the other side. And you can do this lots and lots of times and get tons and tons of data and really uh, fine grain. And so you produce something that's called a tomogram. And a tomogram is much more detailed than a regular x-ray and it produces images of lots of different structures, not just bones, but you've also got organs and blood vessels and tumors. And this is the technique that was used, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to see whether um, mummies, for instance, have um, problems with their, their veins, whether they have heart disease in the way that we have heart disease, that sort of thing. So you can combine CT scans with endoscopy in order to get lots of information about what's happening inside the body. And this provides information by looking under the wrappings and inside the various containers that are associated with mummies. And it, to quote another expert, allows people to unveil tiny details that bring the past to life. And it also lets you look at anatomical features such as hair. So there's this amazing recent research on a female mummy that was found. And they found, and again I'm going to quote, longer strands at the middle of the scalp drawn back into twists or plates that were then wound around into a tutelus or chignon at the vertex or crown of the head. And this is the amazing amount of detail they're able to get about a mummy by using a CT scan to look through all the wrappings, to look through the sarcophagus, and to look only at the body within and get these incredible details. And they know that this was a style of hair that was potentially inspired by a, a Roman empress who was quite popular at the time. And so they're able to actually kind of place these people then in the political and cultural context of the era in which they died, which already is giving you a whole lot more information than you would have gotten by just looking at that body uh, in its sarcophagus. As I mentioned, you can also begin to look at the details that shed light on the health of people before they died and try to get an idea how they felt, maybe even what killed them. And I mentioned earlier that tooth condition can be really important, overall dental health. So you can look for abscesses, which were very common, and also cavities, which often would lead to sinus infections that could ultimately kill someone. And um, there have been some mummies that have been found to, to show these features, and they even have uh, medicine-dipped linen packing inserted into the cavities of their mouths in order to deal with the fact <laughs> that they are in such pain and such discomfort, and you can find evidence of these things still remaining on the bodies. The facial approximation and facial reconstruction is a step that is very difficult to do. As I said, it involves quite a lot of artistry and not so much science, but it can really give you a, a lot of a sense of who a person might have been, uh, much more so than just looking at a skull. And it relies on certain pieces of scientifically collected information that are associated with the skull. But it's uh, very subjective and is considered generally to be a last resort. So only sometimes will you see this being used because it's not really um, rich, richly associated with data. So you can have two-dimensional and three-dimensional methods. The two-dimensional methods involve sketching the facial features on an overlay of a photograph of the skull. And you can do this by hand or with computer software. And you can use tissue depth markers that can be used to indicate how much fat and muscle and flesh should probably appear over the skull in order to change its shape. <clears throat> and that's something that you're going to have to get a lot of information on, kind of by the circumstances of the mummy. So you need to know what its sex was, what its height was, what its age was, uh, what race it is, and all these are kind of anthropological and archaeological details that you have to get and compile together to help the artist put together this image. So you also can have a three-dimensional model, as I mentioned, 
And this usually involves putting clay on top of the skull, if you want to work it by hand, or using computer rendering software. And people will often use mirrors or mirroring tools, depending on whether it's computerized or not, to allow artists to deal with incomplete material. So if you've only got a portion of the skull, you can use this mirror tool to kind of draw half of the face and then flip it over and then fill out the rest of the face. And the problems with this is that there are often very weak correlations between the bony features of the skull and the soft features of a person's skull or face. And so uh, you might think that someone's actually quite slim based on certain factors, but in reality they had quite a lot of fat and so it would have looked much rounder in the cheeks and in the chin uh, and around the neck area. And so you wouldn't represent them quite as accurately. Another problem is that subcutaneous fat layers can be really highly variable. And both this and other types of tissue can vary depending on age, uh, where you're from in the population, your body type, all sorts of stuff. And so that's why this tends to be preserved only for really kind of extenuating circumstances. And in forensics case, there are actually very strict rules about using these sorts of techniques. But when we're talking about really ancient mummies, when you know, no one's life or reputation is at stake, it's quite a fun exercise to try to get an idea of what these people might have looked like in real life. Now a really crazy thing that's becoming more and more common now is 3D printing. And it's really incredible how this is being used to, to get more information out of mummies. So 3D printing, if you're not familiar with it, is something that's also called additive manufacturing. And basically you're making a solid object from a digital model by laying down successive layers of material in different shapes. And the computer will look at that 3D model and kind of slice it up into various bits that it's capable of manufacturing and gluing together. And this is very different from traditional techniques that tend to cut away excess from one large thing. You're starting off instead with little bits and putting those together. And the printer can work with liquid or powder or sheet and create lots of different stuff to make any shape or any feature. And so it's been used to produce models of mummies and also to recreate other historical features from skeletons. So for example, this was recently used from the, the skeleton that was found of Richard III to facilitate facial reconstruction. Um, so you can take the bits of the skull that you have and, and kind of scan them in and make an image. The computer will, will see that and make a complete rendering then in plastic that you can modify and put clay on top of and put hair on top of and make a physical model that you can then look at or put in a museum. And it's much more uh, lifelike and realistic than you might have had before. You don't have to ever endanger the actual mummy or the actual bones themselves. And this is actually such a fantastic technique that it's been used surgically to facilitate reconstruction of people who have been uh, harmed, and for, for, for example, at, at war. It's also recently facilitated the identification of a soldier who was killed in action in World War I, and they had his body, and they were able to um, take those bones and, and do this 3D construction, create a sketch of what his face might have looked like, and he had relatives back home that were able to identify him after all this year, all these years. So that just gives you an idea of the sorts of amazing details that we can begin to get about mummies, even thousands of years after the fact. That was O oh Death by Ralph Stanley, and that's from the soundtrack of O oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And today on Wildside, we are talking not so much about death per se, but about mummies and mummification. And just before the break, I was talking about all of the stuff that you can learn about mummies um, by analyzing them scientifically. And the one last thing I want to do is kind of give you a very specific case study in which all of these methods were used to really extract just an incredible amount of detail about the mummy itself. And this is something you might have heard about because it happened actually not that long ago and uh, it's actually not so far away from here either. So the mummy is known as Utsi the Iceman, and Utsi has been preserved since about 3300 BC and was discovered in 1991 in the Alps, uh, somewhere between Austria and Italy. And the, the boundary of this was kind of contested, and so for a long time the two countries fought over who actually was the owner of Utsi. And it turns out that Utsi was shot in the back with an arrow, and after this, he very, very quickly died. And because it was so cold up there, 
his body was preserved and was preserved for thousands of years until some hikers happened to find him kind of poking out. And like the people who found uh, the Toland man, they originally thought that he was a recent death, but then upon closer inspection quickly realized that he was very, very old. And one of the things that indicated this, one of many things, was that he had um, pollen and dust grains in his body that were quite ancient. And by studying where these things came from and looking at isotopes in his tooth enamel, researchers were able to find out that he grew up in a place called Feldtherns, but later in life moved to an area about 50 kilometers north from that. And they were able to look at his organs. So for example, they looked at his lungs and they found that they were quite blackened. And this most likely is because he spent quite a lot of time around campfires, as you might expect from someone um, quite early on uh, in human development, they were living outside, it was very cold, they always had fires. They were also able to take a sample of Litzy's DNA and determine his mitochondrial haplotype. Uh, and basically what this means is that you're looking at the DNA that's being passed down through the maternal lin lineage from mother to child. And they determined that he was haplogroup K, which is a, a group of these DNA types that are from Western Eurasia North Africa and South Africa. And we do recognize these because people have the same haplotype today, but his variety was not like any of the other modern varieties. They've had to um, give it a whole new name after, let's see. And this is really interesting because it suggests that he was from a lineage that did eventually die out. Another molecular analysis they were able to do was actually the analysis that helped explain uh, his death and they found something called fibrin in his wound. And fibrin is a protein that appears in fresh wounds but then disappears as the healing continues. So the fact that they were able to find traces of it suggests that he died very quickly after the wound was created. Now Utsi also of course had his intestines intact and so researchers were able to look at the contents of his stomach and intestines and find out what his last meals were. And one of these was eaten only two hours before he died. So they found meat of, of two different types of deer. They also found herbal bread and signs that both of these meals were accompanied by grain and roots and fruits that had been collected in the area. Hair analysis was quite interesting because it also kind of provided some information on dietary components and also suggested that he was involved in a lot of copper smelting because they found lots of particles of copper and also arsenic. Plus he was carrying a very nice copper weapon with him. Some of the pollen that was found on Otsi was only a few hours old and it came from the hop hornbeam plant and the age of this suggests that Otsi must have died in the spring. Um, but obviously it was a very cold spring or quite early in the spring and that's why uh, he was able to be preserved in that ice after all that time. Analysis of Utsi's hip and leg bones suggested that he had long walked um, quite long distances over hilly terrain, and this was quite an unusual thing for people at this time. They tended to be a little bit, not that they weren't nomadic, but they, they did kind of stay in one place for long periods of time. You wouldn't expect quite this much movement. And so people suggested that perhaps Utsi was a shepherd that would spend a lot of time up in these high mountain passes. Now, the poor guy was not in the greatest of health, uh, even despite the, even, even without considering the fact that he was shot by an arrow. He had whipworm, which is an intestinal parasite, and the researchers were able to find DNA of this. And also, he had lines on his fingernails that indicated that he had gone through three bouts of sickness in the preceding year. So, obviously, life is not that easy for people living in this era, so I guess that's not a big surprise. He also had cavities in his teeth. And DNA analysis suggested that he was most likely lactose intolerant, and that's not something that the tolerance of lactose is not really something that uh, evolved until a little bit later in, in the human uh, kind of lifespan, if you will, because we got much more closely associated with cows as we went on. Now, he had several tattoos in places where he had signs of osteochondrosis and spondylosis, and so that suggests that maybe. Uh, there were these kind of treatments for the pain in his knees and elsewhere in his legs. The, the tattoos were being applied kind of similar to the way acupuncture therapy works. So they're targeting these certain regions where there is this uh, aging process that's making him feel pain. Otsi is also uh, 
the recipient of the dubious distinction of being the first known human to suffer from Lyme disease. So he does again have the DNA of um, the parasites responsible for Lyme disease. And he also possesses the oldest blood cells that were ever identified to be intact. And researchers found that they looked pretty much exactly like the blood cells that we have today. So there's been very little evolution over time. So that just kind of gives you uh, a little bit of an idea of just how much information can be extracted using modern scientific techniques to understand the life and death, both, of a, a mummy. And I think that's just truly amazing. And in case that hasn't quite convinced you that mummies are worth thinking about, I have a, a few other crazy facts. So first of all, during the Middle Ages, people often bought ground-up mummies to use as medicine, and this was known as mollified man. They also ground up mummies uh, in the early 17th century in particular, but no longer by the 19th century, in order to make a, a brown pigment for painting, and this was known as mummy brown. And people didn't really understand, they didn't put two and two together, that that's where this was coming from. So eventually this was discontinued once they realized uh, how kind of rude that was, to say the least. Another kind of interesting fact, although a bit horrifying, is that some Buddhist monks used to self-mummify when they felt their time had come. So they had themselves buried in, in a position, uh, in the lotus position, where in conditions such that they would actually slowly mummify uh, as they died and right after they died. Mummified cats were once sent from Egypt to England, and there were probably millions and millions of mummified cats overall. Certainly thousands made their way here, uh, and these were ground up and used for fertilizer. You can currently pay thousands of dollars to have yourself or your pet mummified if you want to continue in that Egyptian style. Um, modern day mummies are still discovered and some of them actually have no explanation. Uh, and These are sometimes used by the church as evidence of miracles. So there are periodically places that pop up that seem to have the right mixture of humidity or lack thereof, and temperature and other conditions to facilitate the creation of mummies. And these are always kind of weird but also strangely interesting. There are now, however, modern methods of creating mum mummies basically on purpose, um, preserved body parts for study, especially in scientific uh, and medical areas. So it's called plastination, where you're basically swapping out all of the soft tissues that would decompose and putting in plastic instead and you've got all the other same components and you can handle these things and look at them and dissect them and no decomposition will continue. And one last very odd fact is that in 2010 a forensic archaeologist who studied how mummies should be made um, to make them most like the historical mummies, he actually mummified a real person who donated his body to the cause and they filmed the entire experience in a documentary that was aired on British television, which you may have seen, and if you haven't, you can look it up and explore it. So that's the end of all that I have to tell you about mummies and the process of mummification, and hopefully, if you weren't appalled by all of that, you were instead quite interested and found it to be as fascinating as I always have. Um, this is my last broadcast for a few weeks because I'll be off to California for a field course, but I have recorded some songs to keep you entertained in my absence, and hopefully um, that will last for a few weeks, and then you can hang in there and wait until I'm back with a more cheerful topic than mummification uh, after the break. So I will talk to you in April. <laughs>